Kuyamora Dumela Saubona Ita. Thank you, Church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as elder and pastor. And this morning, just to open up God's word with you. Um, this morning, we will learn a little bit more about Holy Week, a little bit more about Palm Sunday as we engage the scriptures. This is a picture of James Watson and Franz Crick. They are scientists who studied at the University of Chicago. They worked in the field of genetics for years. They had a view and understanding of DNA as they studied. They found help through photographs and x-rays performed by Rosalind Franklin. The x-rays were showing and enabling James and Francis to understand the structure of DNA and how it's formed. So with the x-rays, they were able to understand the structure of DNA and how DNA is formed, and they won a Nobel Peace Prize. So their previous ideas about DNA were changed by this new understanding of DNA from seeing DNA on an X-ray in a different light. This is the Iron Man movie from 2008. There's been a a bunch of them, but Tony Stark, a manufacturer of weapons used by those who can afford them, realizes that his weapons in the wrong hands actually bring about destruction, and he decides to become Iron Man himself and use these weapons for what he deems to be good. What you will see is that these penny drop moments enable people to better understand and see what they might not have understood or seen before. Throughout Mark, the disciples, the chief priests and scribes have battled through who Jesus is. This is an image of the Bible project, so it's a Mark poster. The first eight chapters are themed as who Jesus is. Who Jesus is in the first eight chapters. Mark says in verse 1, Jesus is the Son of God. So Mark already spills the beans, lets the cat out of the bag and says, Jesus is the Son of God. He then goes to show the establishment of Jesus' ministry, which include preaching, teaching, and healing. So the th- second theme in this, in this book is found in chapters 8 to 10 of Mark. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? What does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? This morning we start in the last five chapters of the book, in the theme, How Jesus Becomes King. How Jesus Becomes King. This morning I want you, I want, I want you to help me as we progress through this book. I'm going to ask you to snap your fingers when you hear the word king. So snap your fingers is a a poetry thing. So I'm going to ask you to snap your fingers when you hear the word king. Snapping of fingers is used in poetry sessions as a sign of agreement and show of support for the poet. When I say king, you snap your fingers. You snap your fingers because you see that Jesus is king and I'm in an agreement with the reality this truth, the reason why he has come, and why we will click our fingers. Make sense? Okay. So the crowds, the disciples, the scribes, and the Jewish leaders will come to understand who Jesus is. The penny will drop, and what Jesus has come to do. As we start Holy Week, my hope is that for some of us, the penny would drop, and for others, our lives would be moved and transformed because Jesus announces himself as king. Jesus saves humanity and Jesus reigns as king. So let's pray as we get into God's word. Lord, we thank you that um, this morning we can worship you, we can um, fellowship with one another, and that at this point in time we can sit under the lordship of your word. I pray that this morning by your spirit, that you would calm our hearts, calm our minds, and help us to focus on you. May we hear you speak through my vocal cords. Would you do a work in all our hearts? Would you transform our hearts? Would you change our hearts? You know where we are. Would you draw us nearer to yourself? May we see and truly understand who Jesus is, and may that truth transform us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Three points this morning. Jesus announces his kingship. 
the king come to save. Crown him king or kill him. Three points. So background. So far in the book of Mark, we have come to know about Jesus, who the writer says is the son of God in verse 1. Let's the, let's the, the cat out the bag says it bluntly. We then see Jesus start his earthly ministry, which involves preaching, teaching, and performing miracles, which even includes the raising from the dead of a little girl. Even though Jesus preaches, teaches, and performs miracles, we understand that he primarily came to warn people about the soon coming kingdom, to call people to repentance and to forgive sins. We see this in Mark 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus is the good news and he brings the good news. He calls on people to follow him. He calls the disciples and they walk with him as he teaches throughout the region. A couple of times we see Jesus stop the disciples or people that he heals from declaring who he is as king and a son of God. He is king because he is the son of God. He is the Messiah who came to save and redeem people to God, which he does by educating, by teaching, by healing and forgiving sins. A couple of times as the readers of the book, we realize that the disciples, scribes and Pharisees didn't fully understand who Jesus is or had other ideas about who they thought Jesus was and what he came to do. Here's a question. Who do you say Jesus is? How is this evident in the way that you live? The passage this morning is a significant passage in the life of the church as it's called Palm Sunday. It starts the Holy Week, even though Holy Week is not an obligation. Um, Paul never highlights this week as a practice of observance. A Holy Week, however, is an opportunity to walk alongside the church as the bride, as a church would walk with the bridegroom, Jesus, in this historic week. It is a time for us to focus on the most important of realities that took place years ago with the hope that the penny drops and our affection is heightened. Our affection is bound to King Jesus, who came in peace, humility, and gentleness to pay our ransom so that the bride his church would be his. Even though the Bible does not explicitly command the importance to this week, we can implicitly see the importance in the Gospels. The Gospel of Mark has six chapters out of the 16 specifically for this important week. The Gospel of Matthew has 28 chapters, and eight of these 28 are about this final week before the crucifixion of Jesus, a crucifixion that declares him king. In his death, resurrection, and ascension. The Gospel of Luke has six chapters about Holy Week. The Gospel of Jan John has 10 chapters out of 21 chapters. So almost half the book is about this week. The last week of our Lord Jesus' life. His betrayal, his trial, his crucifixion, which we will see on Friday, and his triumphant resurrection as king, which we will celebrate on Sunday. We have a Holy Week guide that we'll send out, as I mentioned earlier, so look out for that so you can follow with us through Holy Week. As the emotions of sadness and ultimate victory move throughout this week, we will see in this week just how deep the Father's love for us is. While we were still sinners, King Jesus died for us. That's Romans 5 verse 8. Our first point, Jesus announces his kingship. Mark 11 verse 1 says, When they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here right away. So they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied by a door. They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They answered them just as Jesus had said, 
So they let them go. They brought the call to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So let me set the scene. It is nearing a time or event of Passover, a Jewish festival where, where Jews would come together to celebrate God's promise to the people of Israel. So Passover happens during this period and is celebrated in Jerusalem. So Jesus with the disciples approached Jerusalem, verse 1. The importance of the city of Jerusalem is in, is in Jesus being brought to the city of Jerusalem as a child. Jesus came to the temple to observe Jewish festivals like Passover. Um, and as an adult, Jesus preached and healed in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is spiritually the footstool of, of God as it is where God dwells. We see this in Psalm 132, verse 13 to 14. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem and will dwell there forever. Jerusalem is also the place where Jesus is crucified and resurrected. So Jesus approaches Jerusalem and before entering to Jerusalem asked two disciples to enter Bethpage and Bethany, which are two towns basically near one another, about three kilometers from Jerusalem. Jesus asked the two disciples to get a donkey, one that has not been used and untied. Just take a moment to consider this. To listen to this. Jesus asked his disciples to untie a donkey and bring it to him to be used, one that is unused. A donkey was a valuable possession. Upper middle class families would use these to continue making money. It was a symbol of status. This would be similar to me walking into the yard of someone with a Fortuna or an X3 or a Q3 that has never been ridden by the family. So just brand new bought. It still has the blue or the yellow num a placeholder for the number plate. It doesn't have a license disc. Starting the car. And if you come out, only if you come out, I say to you, the Lord needs it. This family, upon hearing the Lord needs it, lets go of the donkey. Why did they just let go of the donkey? This prized possession. A young donkey one that hasn't been used, that's still got uh, lots of life in it. Why did they let go of this donkey? It would be like Jesus saying, surrender your house, your car, your investment account, your children, your future, your aspirations, for the Lord needs it. But they let go of the donkey because the Lord needs it. They surrender the donkey because of the authority of Jesus seen throughout Mark. He is the Son of God, verse 1. He has authority to forgive sins. We see this as he forgives sins throughout Mark. He's got the authority to perform miracles, and he is king. Jesus could have sent the disciples to Jerusalem to return with a donkey, but he asked them to enter Bethany and Bethpage. This is because this is a place where Jesus taught, Jesus performed miracles, and Jesus healed. This is a place where Mary anointed Jesus' feet with perfume. It was the home of Simon the leper. It was the home of Lazarus, Lazarus who was Jesus' friend. Jesus raised him from the dead in this town. So the people in this town know who the Lord is. They have seen him move around their midst. They have seen him teach and perform miracles. They've seen his authority. They've seen his power. And they released the donkey. They knew who the Lord was and they released the donkey. They recognize who is asking and they obey. Who do we say Jesus is? If he is Lord, do we obey him immediately? If you ask for your car, your house, your investment account, children or future, do we obey? Even as I say, this, there are things in that list that make me hesitant. But if Jesus is king, if Jesus is Lord and he calls us, then we should obey if we see him as king and Lord. If there are things that we're hesitant to give, then maybe those things are taking the place of God in our lives. 
Again, Jesus asked for a donkey, but Jesus could have asked for a chariot with a horse. Why did Jesus ask the disciples to bring a donkey? Zechariah 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Jesus riding on the donkey is the fulfillment of Scripture. The fulfillment of Scripture is important to Jesus in declaring that Jesus is king. Because it says the king is coming to you. He will be seen on a young, not fully adult male donkey. One that hasn't been used or ridden before. Jesus is coming as a gentle and lowly king. Zechariah 9 verse 10 continues. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the house from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Ephrates river to the ends of the earth. Jesus is fulfilling the scripture in Zechariah. A king who is coming, who is already victorious, who is humble, who is lowly, and who's bringing peace. A quick side road. Leaders or kings often rode on donkeys in part. If a king was coming in peace or arriving back in the city after war, after victory, they would ride on a donkey. King Solomon rode on a donkey on the day he was recognized as leader of Israel. Jesus gets a donkey in which he will ride into to Jerusalem, signifying peace rather than war. The fulfillment of scripture from Zechariah shows this in verse 10. Cut off the chariot. The chariots are the main vehicle of war. Take away the horse from Jerusalem. No need for horses as there were signs of war or impending battle. The bow will be removed. No need for bows as they were used for fighting. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He brings a message of reconciliation. His dominion will extend from sea to sea. The king will control extended territory. He will rule. See another announcement of the king. They brought the call to Jesus and and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Mark says many people in verse 8. So we already knew or we already know the people in Jerusalem at this time looking forward to the festival that is coming. Mark says those who went ahead and those who followed shouted. So people from Bethany and Peth Page, who Jesus knew, had seen the anointing and power of Jesus. Here Jesus is taking a donkey into Jerusalem. They follow Jesus, some before him, some after him. They proclaim Jesus as king in spreading their clothes and cutting palms before him. The spreading of clothes on the road can be seen in 2 Kings 9 verse 13. Jehuah is anointed as king of Israel And as he walks, people remove their cloaks and place them before him as a sign of honor. So what they're doing, people from Bethany and Bethpage, is a sign of honor to the king who's coming on a donkey, not bringing war, but bringing peace because he's already victorious. Palm trees are a sign of success and triumph. So Jesus is not surprised as Jesus sits on the, on the donkey, as Jesus rides the donkey into Jerusalem, as people are laying their cloaks down, Jesus is not surprised. It is not like that Oscar moment when Denzel Washington or Meryl Streep is called upon to accept the award where they act shocked. Jesus isn't having a moment where he's uncertain if he should take this title of king. Mark 11 verse 17 says, He was teaching them, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. 
you should see there that Jesus just called the temple in Jerusalem his temple, his house. He found hawkers and gamblers and moved them, saying, my house is, saying my house, and he is saying he is God. Matthew 21, Jesus removed the hawkers and gamblers and says it is his house. Like in Mark verse 11, verse 17, he heals the blind and the lame, which we see in Matthew, a similar account. He heals the blind and the lame. And from verses 15 of Matthew, it says, when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonders that he did and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus replied, yes, have you never read? Have you prepared praise? from the mouth of infants and nursing babies. Then he left them, went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. Indignant means showing anger. Or, or, or. So, so these scribes are showing anger. They are annoyed. The chief priests and the scribes are annoyed at how the children call Jesus the Messiah because they say he's the son of David. Because they understand the Old Testament. So they hear the children calling him the son of David, which means he's the Messiah. So they're annoyed. But Jesus says yes to their question. Jesus affirming he hears the children and is acknowledging who he is as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as King. Jesus has planned and knows the importance of what is to come. He announces himself as King, coming into Jerusalem knowing what is to come, that he would be rejected by some and killed. Our second point the king come to save. The king is announced. He is seen and experienced as he enters Jerusalem. As the town stands still and people rejoice and celebrate the king who has come. The people shout, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna comes from the Hebrew phrase Hoshiana. This same phrase is found in one place in the Old Testament, which is Psalms 118 verse 25. Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. So the phrase Hoshiana means save us. It is a cry to God for help. In saying Hosanna, the people are acknowledging Jesus as the one foretold to save them. Their shouts, Hosanna, show the hope that they have of Jesus coming to establish God's kingdom. The cries and shouts of Hosanna speak about their belief that Jesus saves and that Jesus brings salvation. The crowd is acknowledging Jesus as a seed from the lineage of David. They, from all prophecies they know, are expectant of a savior born from the family tree of David, the Messiah, the anointed savior, the king. The word Hoshiana has evolved as, the, as the, the Hebrew language has evolved from a cry or plea to also proclamation. So the original meaning of the word Hoshiana can be used as a cry or a plea, but the word can also be used as proclamation. Sort of meaning salvation has come. So think of Mr. Bean who climbs up three flights of stairs to jump off a water board into the pool. He gets on top, immediately looks down and sees that he cannot do this. Think of him shouting Hosanna, which would then mean, save me, save me to the, to the people that are around there. He does not shout Hosanna, but think about him there shouting Hosanna. But Hosanna can also be the proclamation or exaltation in hooray, I have been saved. And in this instance, he's saved by the kid stepping on his feet and him falling into the water. So his fear of heights is then resolved. But Hosanna can be seen in both lights. Hoshiana can be seen in both lights as a cry or a plea for help, but can also be seen as proclamation and exaltation. In saying Hosanna in the highest is a cry of praise and ad adoration to God. Salvation has come from God. Praise to God. Hosanna. Salvation has come. However, the salvation that they were waiting for is a different kind. They were waiting for a king to come and provide political salvation. 
to dethrone Rome and provide political power through Israel. They welcomed Jesus out of their desire for a savior who would lead the revolt and dethroning of Rome. But Jesus was very clear about which kingdom he was coming to bring. Mark 1 verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. They were thinking of Jesus as a means to an end, their end being political freedom. The same crowd that were placing their cloaks and palms before Jesus were shouting, crucify, a few days later because they saw Jesus but didn't recognize who he is. They turned on Jesus because of failed expectations. Our third point, crown him or call him king. The Jewish leaders, chief priests, and scribes in Mark 11, verse 18, start to plot a plan to kill Jesus. We should have seen throughout Mark that the chief priests and scribes had been growing discontent and angry at Jesus. There are a few reasons which include, you'll see a slide behind me, Jesus eating with sinners. This is instead of chilling with them and distancing himself from sinners. They, dis they grow discontent with Jesus eating with sinners. And their perception of Jesus disobeying the law, like healing on the Sabbath. Claiming higher authority as Jesus casts out demons and forgives sins. These are some of the reasons why they would be wanting to plot and kill Jesus, as we see from Mark. Finally, Jesus now calls the temple his house. He has affirmed what the children say about him from the family tree of David. He arrived to a king's welcome through the gates of Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna. The scribes and chief priests see that they are to lose their place and influence. Mark 14, Mark 14 verse 61. Again, the high priest questioned him. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The chief priests and scribes can't recognize the authority or the identity of Jesus. They believe Jesus is blaspheming. If he was the Messiah, he would hang out with them. He would not disobey the law in their own understanding. He would surely ride into Jerusalem on a horse to reestablish the Jews and Israel's power. You see, the king came on a donkey to die for you and me. You crown him and he is king over your life. The other response is not to see him and to reject Jesus. To see his authority to fear not being in control of your own life, to not, not, to not recognize the king in his identity, to recognize the king is to have a life that looks like and reflects the truth, a life lived for and pointing to the cross of Christ, a life spent not storing treasures in the barn, which is a good thing, but a life spent storing treasures in heaven, which is an even better or an everlasting thing. To recognize the king is to not have anything that is more important than him. Like the king calling for the donkey, for the car, for the house, the education, the hopes, the investment accounts, the dreams, the children, the purpose, but surrendering it to King Jesus while singing Hosanna, salvation has come. Hosanna, the king has come. There is no middle ground. It's either we give ourselves to the king because we recognize him as king, or we don't because we desire to be lord of our lives. There's no middle ground. There should be a change in how we live if Jesus is king in our lives. John Piper says, why don't people ask us about our hope? The answer is probably that we look as if we hope in the same things they do. Our lives don't look like they are on the Calvary Road, stripped down for sacrificial love, serving others with a sweet assurance that we don't need to be rewarded in this life. 
That's the middle ground. That's rejection of Jesus. So our lives should reflect the hope that we have in King Jesus. Revelation 3 verse 14 says, Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's where the lukewarm stays. As we close, let's consider this. Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey, humble and lowly, comes in peace as a king would come after victory with shouts of Hosanna. Shouts of salvation has come. Salvation is here. King Jesus is here. When Jesus returns, his ultimate return, which we eagerly await and anticipate, we have already, through his word, experienced and witnessed the fulfillment of Scripture, of his birth, fulfillment of Scripture, of his life, his death, resurrection, and ascension. This holy week, we will again be reminded of his death and resurrection. We will feel the sadness and joy. Because of the fulfillment of Scripture, we can believe and await the last fulfillment of Scripture, which is his return. When he returns, he will be on a white horse. Revelation 19 verse 11. Then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse. Its riders called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except him. He wore a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the, the winepress of the fiery anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe, and he on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. When he returns on the white horse, he will bring judgment and war. This judgment will be for those who have not crowned him king. Those who are Lord of their own lives. Those who don't know him as king. There is still time. If you don't know him as king, he desires for you to know him. He desires to have you as his friend. He has a deep love for you. It's seen in Jesus, seeing the weight of this week at the top of Palm Sunday, walking into Jerusalem and knowing how hard this week will be, but committing to face this week so that he can die on the cross, rise again, and be crowned king. In the rejoicing, we will see the palm tree used in Mark 11 as a sign of honor and success. We will see it as a sign of salvation and celebration. Psalm 96 verse 10 says, um, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. He judges the peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and all that fills it resound let the fields and everything in them celebrate then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the lord for he is coming for he is coming to judge the earth he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his faithfulness isaiah 55 verse 12 says you will indeed go out with joy and be peacefully guided the mountains and the hills will break into singing before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands they use the palm tree in honor of jesus coming on the horse coming with peace. And the symbolism is, is such that we shall see the same palm trees, the mountains and the hills, break out in song as a sign of salvation and celebration. Salvation and celebration because Jesus is king. Some of the people, as he enters Jerusalem, start to realize that, but some of the people don't. Some of the people think of Jesus as a different kind of king. But the penny is dropping 
as this week unfolds. And for some, it continues to drop. For at the top of this week, we shall see a resurrected king. We already know that as he enters Jerusalem, that he's already victorious. That he is king. That he brings peace. That he brings love. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus brings salvation. Jesus is King. Let's pray. I'm going to give a few moments of quiet where you might want to speak to God and tell Him where you are. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're a God who brings salvation. We thank you that we can shout Hosanna as Christ for you to save us and shout Hosanna in knowing that you have brought salvation, for salvation is yours to bring. Lord Jesus, as we look at this week, as we follow the, the greater church throughout Holy Week. We pray that you would continue to illuminate to us this week. And my, may our affection for you continue to build and grow. If we don't see you as king, we pray that you'd continue to do a work in us that will illuminate to us that you are king where we have other things as king over our lives, would you remove those things so that you can take your rightful place? And if we have put our faith and trust in you, I pray that you would bring us much encouragement, much joy, much peace as we walk through this week and remember your love. Remember how deep your love is for us. Remember your sacrifice. Remember that you have already brought salvation. So do a work in us, Lord. You know where we are. As we approach Good Friday, as we witness your death, may we be strengthened and overjoyed in remembering that Sunday is coming. And when it comes, may we be overjoyed. For you are resurrected. That's what makes you king. The Son of God, the Messiah who came to save his people. As we respond in song, as we sing Hosanna, may we be reminded that salvation has already come and you have brought it. Speak to us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. And would the meditation of our heart be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.